We are also recording this session. So this will be posted to my uh, Institute Du Fromage YouTube page for anybody to watch free of charge at their convenience. Perfect. So I'm gonna continue. I wish I should have brought in some music uh, to play in the background, some good, I don't know. For some reason, I think charcuterie deserves 80s rock band, uh, some like arena rock. I don't know why, but that's just what I love. Uh, so hang tight with us, everybody. Thanks for joining us. If you get a second, um, be getting your samples out. We're gonna be tasting product with these amazing producers today. So now's the time to get everything out, get it opened up and start getting ready to taste and learn about some charcuterie. And you all will see how good I am at talking to fill time, uh, which I think I do excel at. Uh, at least my mama says so. Love it. All right. And welcome, welcome, welcome. We've got people logging in, so I'm going to be letting people in as we go along. Uh, so do hang tight with us. Once we get a good fair amount of people in here, I'm going to go ahead and get started. So just chill out, relax, grab a piece of delicious cured meat, and join us for a beautiful session. Nathan can hear us now, right, Nathan? I can hear you. That's Tyler. Hey! <laughs> What's going on on the Brolum's crew? Y'all need to carry all of this meat up in Idaho. I'm telling you, that's what Idaho is missing. Yeah, I full screen in Natasha again. Okay, mute us so we're not bugging everybody. Yeah, y'all, I'm gonna, I'm gonna have to mute y'all. I love you. I think you're wonderful, but I'm gonna put y'all on mute. Welcome to the show. You guys have heard some of this, but now you actually get to listen to the people who make it and sell it and live charcuterie every single day. This is awesome. So welcome, welcome, welcome. Ah, I love this. Our participants are coming on in. So we didn't get to send. Uh, and we didn't send any alcohol with this one. So we're going to, this is because we're talking about dry cure. This is a dry tasting. No. Okay. Sometimes my jokes land. Most times they don't, but I'm going to keep working at it. Hopefully you see that I have started a chat. So for those of you who are already here, uh, if you have questions along the way, if you've been to one of my trainings, you know, I don't mind at all to be interrupted with questions. Questions are how we get answers. Answers are how we learn. So please use the chat feature though, to make sure that you would, you chat in the questions and I'll read them to our uh, esteemed guests, if you don't mind. That way we don't have like a hundred people trying to yell and chat with us. All right, more people are coming. Beautiful, beautiful. You know, it seems like I write a lot of cheese songs, but I haven't written a lot of charcuterie songs. So I got to work on that. Um, you know, something like there's a cure that ails you. I was trying to think of something really fun to call this class, but I think my sense of humor gets missed on a lot with a lot of people. So I didn't want to do that. Perfect. I'm still feeling some good time. Excellent. We got a few people joining on here. I see some amazing faces, some wonderful teams. Tyler and the Brolums team. I'm going to tell you what. Hello, Brolums out there. I see you. I miss you. It was such a good time being able to come out and talk to you guys and teach you about cheese and meat. And I'm so thankful that y'all are joining to learn even more. And to our presenters here, we need to sell like Brolums. They, their customers love me. I tell you what. And Cleaver and Cork, I see you out there. Hey, welcome. You know, I love it. Thank you for joining us. There's so many wonderful people here.
And I know, so one note I've got for myself is how to fill this time better when I'm letting everybody in. So I'm going to work on that team. Don't worry. So while we're waiting, anybody out there that's, that's typing while we're waiting to talk, what's your favorite charcuterie item? Just chat it in, hit in that chat feature and tell me, is it a salami? What type of salami? Is it a ham? Is it a, a pate or a tureen? Or is it like smoked salmon? Don't forget, fish falls under the charcuterie range as well. Type it in, prosciutto de parma. <laughs> prosciutto de parma, that's, that's a classic. That's a classic, love it myself. Bacon butter from Spotted Trotter. Ha, 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 I love it. Can I count? to wine. You can like wine. There are salamis made with wine. Uh, speck, peppered salami, speck, smoked sausage, karst cheddar. That's, I, I dig it. I like it. I like it. My favorite, well, prosciutto is a classic. You know, it's a classic. So prasada, that's awesome. Um, but I would have to say, Excellent. All righty. All right. Capicola, Guanchale, Bresola. Look at here, we've got some good ones coming in. I love that. Roasted ham. Cecina? That's a new one for me. Am I crazy? Speck, that's awesome. We got a lot of you see, we got so many meat lovers in here. So many. A little uh this good. This one to the right. Here, you do it. All right. Hello. Hi. Hello. Welcome, everybody. Once you come in, I love a hello. But if you don't mind, please hit that mute button for me. Uh, and if you have any questions, comments, or snide remarks, hit that up in the chat comment for me. But please mute, mute, mute. It appears somehow a blue line has appeared on the screen. And that I did not anticipate. Son of a gun. Hang on one second, team. I'm going to take this down and reshare it so I can remove that blue line. But don't go anywhere. We're going to start in just a couple of minutes. We've got almost 100 people logged in. Hang tight for just another minute. I'm going to stop share and reshare. All right, I think that alleviated the problem. Perfect. Thank you everybody for being so cool and awesome and amazing and loving good meat. You know, um, welcome to the Vegans Anonymous Club. Just kidding, no. Too soon, too soon, my bad, okay. The real question is, what is in Nathan's mug? What is in Nathan's mug? We don't know, it could be anything. All righty, team. Just another couple of minutes. Whiskey. <laughs> Donald, good guess, but no, but no. It is a clear liquid. Give it to you. <laughs> Ether, no, that's too much. Another question. You were, vodka. Shh. You guys were great about mentioning your favorite charcuterie item. Is there a charcuterie pairing that you absolutely love? Speaking of alcohol, do you guys pair any wine or any booze with any of your favorite charcuterie? Chat it up if you do. Share your knowledge. I love to hear what everybody's into. Vodka, vodka. Everybody's like, you know, this is what happens when you have a training at the end of the day. You get a lot of vodka answers. All right. So we're six minutes over. I am going to go ahead and we got our chat going. We've got about 100 people in here. I'm going to keep admitting people 
as we go along. But for those of you who showed up on time, thank you. Mitch will reward you by going ahead and getting started. Awesome. So keep it on. We had uh, some sherry with Calabrese. I love that. Irish cheddar with cab. Love it. Oh, my God. We got so many fun pairings today. All righty, ladies and gentlemen. Let's go ahead and get started. Thank you again so much for joining us. Uh, keep staying in the chat feature and keep yourself muted if you don't mind. Today is going to be great. I'm going to talk for a little bit, and then I'm going to introduce all of our esteemed speakers in just a little bit. But first, I wanted to brag. This is a picture of the cheese board that I sent, or excuse me, look at that, I'm so selfish. We sent, uh, and I wanna send a, send a special thanks uh, to Maha, Kevin, and Delia. Thank you for sending all these samples. All of these samples were donated lovingly uh, by these uh, presenters. Thank you. Y'all know that for 150 people, this is a lot of samples. So this is a big deal and a big investment for all of us. So thank you for attending and thank you guys for sending this. This is amazing. What you've received today is you've got some Irish cheddar. You've got some Jambon de Paris uh, ham. You've got duck rayette. We've got uh, petite toast. We've got speck. We've got mixed olives. We've got a beautiful Toscano uh, salami. We've got shell and bell cheese, fromage a mi uh, cherry spread. We've got from Spotted Trotter, we've got Finocchiona. We've got uh, the Salsaison and we've got the Georgia Blue. So, so many wonderful things. And this is just what I could do with it. Uh, no big deal. I mean, whatever. I'm sure y'all could make a great board too. But I just like to show what you're able to do just with this sample kit. And also, thanks to let me get it on the screen. Gourmet Dash. Gourmet Dash packaged all these up and got these sent out to everybody. And I want to send a very special thank you to Whitney and Tatiana and the team out there. Uh, and by the way, if you need to shop for some great gourmet products, gourmet.dash.com is a good way to go. If you're in a business and looking for a drop ship partner, hit me up. I know who you can talk to. All right. Enough. You see, I got some, that's some good plugs, right? <laughs> All right, enough of that. So today we've got for you uh, the Spotted Trotter, the Three Little Pigs, and we've got Ollie. So we've got three premier American producers. Uh, and I, I'm really uh, ecstatic about being able to share all of this with you. So hang on. Get yourself on mute if you don't mind. I sure appreciate you. Okay. Before we get started and we get the speakers in, I do want to point out that we all know charcuterie is very popular, right? Charcuterie is awesome. We've been throwing the word around. If you've been online on the social media, you'll probably see a lot of charcuterie board posts. Oh, and they're so beautiful and they got flowers and candy and chocolate and everything. That's cool. Oh, but I'm going to tell you something, y'all. Words have meaning. Charcuterie. It's cured flesh. And, to and for me personally, this is my personal soapbox. For me personally, if you're going to have a charcuterie board, you got to have charcuterie on it. And charcuterie has to be the star of the show. And that's my little that's my little two cents. If everybody else wants to chat on that, that's fine. But our good friends at the IDDBA, uh, they have started up a certified Salumier program. And look at here. <laughs> I am one of the, uh, the initial class to be able to earn this designation of being a certified salumier. This is along the same lines of a certified cheese professional, which a lot of you may know right now uh, and uh, understand. So that's pretty cool. I just wanted to touch on it. They're not giving me any money for this, but I think raising awareness and education for charcuterie is a good thing. So I just want to throw all this information out here for you. We got a lot of details up on the screen. Uh, it's going to be happening on June 4th at IDDBA in Atlanta. So if you come on down to my town, Atlanta, Georgia, you'll be able to take the exam. Um, so here's just the thing. Uh, exam closes. The registration closes April 29th. You got a cost of 450 bucks. If you're a member, uh, you got to have 1,440 hours of experience to even apply. But the bottom 
education at iddba.org if you want any questions about it or simply go to their website and they have a lot of information there for you to help you learn about it. Um, this is just a content outline. The content outline uh, is a delineation of the major domains and the practices tasks performed and knowledge applied by a charcuterie professional in the practice of their profession. So if you've done the CCP, if you know about the certified cheese professional, jump in on this. This is a great way to learn more about charcuterie and also prove your worth, get an extra badge. Uh, I think this is what our customers that come into our retail establishments, these are what they're gonna start to care about. Besides customers wanting to support businesses who support their employees and who take pride in the products that they sell, they want to know that their employees get the opportunity to learn more and they want to talk to the more educated salespeople inside a store. So if you're if you're in a business and you're thinking about supporting your people, definitely do this. If you are a cheesemonger or if you work behind the deli counter and you're looking for that badge of honor and to learn more, this is a great program to do and I highly suggest it. Jump into it, right? And here's just a little bit about the exam. It's 100 questions where it covers preparation of charcuterie products and merchandising. It also covers marketing, sales, customer service and merchandising, product handling, business practices and finance, safety, sanitation regulations. So if there's anybody out there looking to grow an employee to a management position, this is also a great foundation for that. If you can't tell, I think it's amazing. I'm proud I did it, glad I did it. You should do it too. Couple of books they recommend. Uh, I tried to read all of these. I, I read slow. I'm, I grew up in Alabama, so, so bear with me. But these are just the books, some great charcuterie books. If you're looking to grow your knowledge, just wanted to pop these up on the screen just to show these, show you these beautiful books, great way to learn. Buy them all. Support your cheese and meat authors, <laughs> right? <laughs> all right, enough about that. Uh, to start out with charcuterie, I do a charcuterie training for my cheese monitors wherever I go, a little charcuterie 101. And I always open with this because I happen to be a big Anthony Bourdain fan, you know, God rest his soul. But this quote is amazing. To me, life without veal stock, pork fat, sausage, organ meat, demi-glaze, or even stinky cheese is a life not worth living. That's just... That's the way I feel. You know, you throw in vanilla ice cream with that and you got me to a T. All right. So before our guests come on, I just wanted to give a tiny little bit. Y'all can tell that I love to talk, right? A tiny little bit like a charcuterie 101, just very many. So charcuterie is a catch-all term used to define a wide range of cooked, cured, or fermented products. So the word itself, and this is where I get on my high horse as far as like the word charcuterie. Um, derived from the French words uh, char, which means flesh, and cute, which means cooked. So it's cooked flesh. The word means cooked flesh. So to be charcuterie, it's got to be flesh. And uh, I love that, that the vegan pâtés or whatever are growing in the world. But let's be honest, like if you buy good meat, there's no, there's no reason to go to that stuff. Cooked flesh is what charcuterie is. And if you hear the word salumi, that's the Italian word. We, we picked up charcuterie because it's a really pretty word in French. Salumi basically means the same thing. Perfect. Oh, and I got a congrats to Tanya from Hannaford for achieving this title as well. So the IDDBA certified salumier. And I wanna say congratulations to Tanya too. Congratulations to all of you who took that exam. All righty. Now charcuterie, as far as the history, Preserved meat, we think it's as old as the history of cheese, probably even older. This probably goes back more to cavemen time, where humans have been preserving meats for over 10,000 years. And it's thought that humans as early as cave dwellers learned that by hanging meat high enough above a fire, that meat would slowly dry and last for a little bit longer. Now, is there proof of that? There's like archaeologists are finding things like bones in caves and teeth mark on bones and scrapings from, from knives on bones or like, you know, uh, we would have to say uh, stone knives on bones. So we're pretty sure that this is the way it happened. And of course, through time, besides drying and curing, once we human beings learned about salt and how to use salt and how to cure products with salt, 
and we really expanded in our in our world of charcuterie. And of course, once we learned about uh, fermentation, that was like our next step. So those are the main reasons that leads right into the basic production methods of charcuterie. We're talking about basically four methods. Fermentation, where of course sugar is converted into lactic acid. If you know about cheese, you know something about that. We've got dry curing, where salt is rubbed on the outside of meat and it's aged. We also have smoking, we're curing over cold smoke uh, and also cooking, applying heat to cook where you're not curing or fermenting. So if you want to start out your, your journey in charcuterie, those are the basic four methods that we're going to talk about. And for the first one, I'm going to lead in talking about speck. So let's get that meat out of the box and let's start taking a look at this beautiful cut of meat. Anybody want to answer? What style of what method of, uh, of production do you think they use for speck? Is this fermented? Is this cooked? Is this smoked? Is this cured? I'm going to say it's cured and smoked. That's what you look at. When you smell this ham, it's got a nice light smokiness about it. This was actually used with smoke. Some producers can go into a liquid smoke and that's not as great. But if you have a real smoke, it's freaking awesome. So the Italian cured smoked meat native to Alto Adige, a region that straddles Northern Italy and Southern Austria. Now note that speck from Alto Adige uh, enjoys a protected designation of origin status. We all know about our, our protected cheeses. We have protected meats as well. And it shouldn't confuse it though. The German word for speck refers to the lard. They're really talking about bacon. Here, this is more so going to be the leg quarter of the animal. So to make speck, a bone, uh, a bone pork leg is cured in salt and spices like laurel and juniper, and then intermediately slow cooked use, uh, using pine or like juniper wood for several months. And you're gonna notice you got a deep red color with heavily marbled traces of fat, and you usually serve it thin as an appetizer. I like to wrap this like prosciutto. I like this a little bit better than prosciutto because it's got that smokiness, right? So if everybody wants to take a little bite together, cheers and welcome to Charcuterie 101. Mm. That is amazing. And I did not put a napkin <laughs> in this room. Mm. So with this meat, it's easy to bite into a light smoky flavor that really lends itself going into a bit more like bacon. I love speck. Anybody out there like this taste? And as far as what I would pair with it on my board, I like it with the shell and bell. I think that alpine style cheese, because basically speck is an alpine style meat. And I think they pair beautifully together if you want to try those out. Excellent. All right. Now, enough of Nathan. Let's get to the real deal. Coming up to bat first, we're going to be talking with Kevin Oops, the owner of, and creator of the Spotted Trotter. After that, we're going to be talking to Maha Frige, the president of Three Little Pigs. Trop petit cochon. Love that. I've been eating their products for so long. And then to wrap it up, we are so delighted to get to talk to Delia Michael, who is the director of national accounts for Oli Salumieri. And I, these three are so knowledgeable about these products. I'm gonna go ahead and pass this over and we're gonna get started with Kevin and I'm gonna hush up. Kevin, you're up my friend. Awesome, thanks Nathan. Uh, thank you so much for having me and um, welcome to Charcuterie 101. Um, it's an exciting time to be working in food, uh, especially with the uh, things starting opening back up and um, I'm excited to kind of see what, uh, what the world holds after um, you know, the thing that we've been all dealing with for the past two and a half years. Um, and in light of that, uh, I don't know if you guys know, but today is the anniversary that the country actually shut down. So um, hopefully we'll be able to see uh, more opening up and uh, lots of things happening. Uh, for those of you that work in food service, I'm excited uh, more than ever to see the comeback for you and to see all the things that are going to happen. Um, retail has uh, had its day in the sun over these past two years, I think, and uh, excited to see the transition uh, that, you know, that we hope to see into in food. But um, 
that'll be uh, that'll be coming up uh, right now. Nathan has asked we talk about a couple of uh, points. Um, first is is who I am and how I got started. Um, I'm the owner of the Spotted Trotter. We uh, started uh, about 13, 12 years ago, 12 and a half years ago, um, and I uh, am a chef by trade. Started uh, cooking at a very early age and um, was cooking at some really great restaurants in Atlanta. Um, reached the proverbial glass ceiling, as it were, and went to go out and work in California at some some really the fine institutions like the French Laundry and, and got uh, the bug of making charcuterie at a, a beautiful little charcuterie in Napa Valley called the Fatted Calf. Um, he let me come in and, and train with him and taught me everything I know and said, just don't open a shop here in Napa. Well, that's when a light bulb went off. And I thought that was around 2008, um, 2000, end of 2008. And um, at that time, there was nothing like this in Atlanta. Um, you know, there's a few makers in the, in the United States uh, that were, were making, you know, some good stuff, but by and large in the Southeast was not happening. So I saw that as an opportunity to come um, back to Atlanta and um, open our, our business. Um, we opened in 2009. Uh, I was renting a tiny little deli uh, in Decatur, Georgia, uh, about uh, about 500 square feet, uh, if that. And I was making about a thousand pounds of meat a week by myself, did that for about eight months. And then we hired our first employee. A year later, we got our first bricks and mortar. It was in a strip mall of all places. Uh, not really the manufacturing setting you want to make salami and, and good meats, but it's what we had. It was very close to my home, so I could get up out of bed at 4.30 in the morning and um, do all the things that were necessary uh, to start a small business, as well as you know manufacture the, the quality that we try to create here at the Spotted Trotter. So we had our first uh, sweet, sweet, which was sweet A in this tiny little facility, and then we got sweet B, and four years later, we had sweet C, and then 10 years later, our landlord said, you know what? You guys got to go. So we were in a facility about 2,200 square feet. Um, at the end, we were doing about 5,500 pounds of meat a, a week. Um, and it was uh, enough, to, enough to about kill us. But um, we grew into a facility that we're currently in about three and a half years ago. Um, we uh, bought a, a little building um, on the corner of Moreland Memorial. It's in the heart of Atlanta. Um, it's uh, two stories. So yet again, I've uh, viced us with this uh, horrible creation of having a production on the top floor and a um, curing cave on the bottom. And um, we essentially create everything we can in this facility now. And uh, we're in the throes of uh, developing and building a 24,000 square foot facility um, and slicing line in, uh, in Atlanta. So we're gonna be doing that over the course of the next year. Um, currently, uh, we are in a space where I got started uh, in, in the city of Atlanta as, as a chef and um, was able to create and sell and, and network with a lot of the great uh, people in, in Atlanta and was able to get my start through the network of, of really people that understand food and, and appreciate the quality um, and the integrity in which I was trained in. Um, understanding seasonality, understanding and, and really knowing and partnering with uh, great farms and farmers who uh, create great food. Um, not only from the protein side, but from all the garnishment work that we do and all the spices. Um, so that's a little bit how I got started um, as a chef. And so um, part of the ethos that we helped to create was that we were really going to hire anybody that wasn't interested in, in becoming a, a great culinarian and, and being uh, and having a good education in food. Um, the, uh, the practice in which we hire is, is all having folks that have either owned their own kitchen or um, worked in a really fine institution in food uh, across the country. So we try to really, you know, celebrate that and letting folks know that this is an operation that's owned by chefs and created, um, we create great things knowing the food and knowing and understand flavor and balance and integrity in the food. So we think that that sets, sets us apart. Um, our facility and our production procedures, we're coining a new phrase called New American Charcuterie at the Spotted Trotter. Um, we're a 246 year old country. It's about a 5,000 year old art form. Um, we think it's by, by and large, it's time for the United States to start celebrating what we're doing and creating in this world. So um, it's, it's really important for us to tell the story of charcuterie in the US. Um, and we've uh, coined this phrase, New American Charcuterie. We're currently getting it trademarked to help people really understand that it's, it's about uh, pulling ingredients from the terroir of the area that you live in. So we create great salumi and, and salami and pates and terrines and, and beautiful smoked meats by utilizing the terroir of the Southeastern United States to procure a lot of the ingredients that we get to make our meats. So it's uh, something that we're celebrating by and large with everything that we create. Um, and so our facility and our production procedures also follow suit with that. 
Um, and so it's not just about the contents and the integrity of the ingredients, but it's also about how we're doing it. Um, you know, by and large, Europeans have had a great thrill and a great run with regards to how they create smoked meat or possibly cured meat by packing them with a lot of dry ingredients, a lot of salting. Well, we try to pivot and create a lot of wonderful procedures that aren't quite frankly being used in the world of charcuterie today. Um, and we feel like it's yielding a, a fantastic uh, just flavor texture and, and deep, deep uh, integrity in, in the flavors that you taste. One of the things that you can't really change and create um, is sort of a happy accident for our company. Um, by and large, a lot of the salamis that are being made are being made out West, California, you know, some in the Midwest, uh, you know, up in Minnesota, up in the, the you know, in the, the Colorado area, uh, Northern California and Utah. Um, and those have very cold, tepid climates. Well, one of the things that we had to battle when we first got started was the amount of humidity in Georgia. If you guys have ever been in this throes of the, uh, the country, it's, uh, you can walk outside on a summer day and you begin to sweat immediately. Nathan and I could probably tell you two stories about that. But with regard to how deep the humidity is, we thought at first it might be a hindrance to us. But over a period of time, we learned that the humidity was something that was just fantastic for the salami that we make. So it's gonna be more supple. It's gonna be a little bit more higher moisture content. It's not gonna be as dried out. The mouthfeel will be quite delicate. Um, it's, it's very, very different from what you'd uh, anticipate and expect from a regular salami. So when we think about new American charcuterie, we're thinking about the regionality of food. How we create and what we create in the Southeast at the Spotted Trotter is something that earmarks us as a differentiator and something that no one else in the country or in the world for that matter is doing. Um, our products and how they're made. So we utilize uh, nothing but the finest proteins we can get our hands on. Currently we work with a beautiful uh, farm uh, and a group called Porter Road Butcher. They're based out of uh, Western Kentucky, started in Nashville around the same time that we did uh, in early uh, 2009. They had a small little, uh, little independent um, retail shop in Nashville, and they opened it up uh, to some venture capitalist funding about 40 years ago. Took on a pretty heavy load of about, uh, now I, I won't get into the numbers, but took on a quite a bit of investment. Um, and they opened their first um, processing facility in Western Kentucky. They uh, work with a fantastic group of about 15 cooperative farmers. Um, and then they have a QA that goes around to make sure everybody's doing what they say they're doing and following suit to make sure that the meat stays exactly in check with how they, uh, the standards of operating procedures are for that, that company. Um, and so they're called Porter Road Butcher. Please look them up. Uh, fantastic uh, little unit that we get all of our protein from. Um, my favorite way to enjoy the products that we're tasting together, we'll get into that and I'll tell you a little bit about uh, some of the nuances of new American charcuterie. But first I wanna talk about my favorite uh, topic and that's good mold. If you're buying salami these days, guys, there's one thing that you need to make sure that you absolutely see. And that's this beautiful white mold on the outside of the salami. A lot of folks have lots of questions about that when it arrives in their kitchen. But by and large, if you're buying salami without good mold, it's probably not good salami. Um, salami is, should be made with mold. Uh, that's the lactobacillus. That's the culture that creates the wonderful integrity and the flavor. And, and it gives a, a nuance of a sour, a, ba a balance in sour that every salami should have. Um, and when you see it, when you see a salami without good mold, it's probably going to be heat treated or some type of thermal uh, treatment to it. So just be conscious of that. The other ingredient that you can't see is the one that's often overlooked time after time when people are trying to replicate things and do it faster. It's that ingredient of time. Um, great salami must be made with good time. If you don't put time into it and you don't allow the salami to grow and to develop over a period of time, you're missing out. Uh, it's absolutely something you can taste in the flavor of anybody that's doing it correctly. Um, by and large, in the history of, of charcuterie, uh, these animals were slaughtered in the, in the dead of winter and then they were created to help them get the animals uh, broken down and they would hang those parts and pieces you know, and in, in down in the root cellar or down in a basement or somewhere where it was cool and tepid so that they would have the opportunity to have those product production of meats uh, throughout the summertime. So when you think about what creates that, it, it is that good mold. The mold plays a number of different parts on the salami and can, we can talk about that later. Um, but my favorite way to enjoy the products we're tasting together is primarily through a charcuterie board. Uh, I like to do lots of cooking elements with different parts and pieces that we make. Um, there's a number of different ways you can utilize whole muscle and some different cooking preparations, pairing it with cheese, pairing it warm, 
um, pairing it in salads. There's all sorts of different nuances. We're just now starting to scratch the surface over the last couple of years in charcuterie. And so there's a lot of number of uh, different uh, parts and pieces that we haven't been uh, able to get into just yet. So I'm very excited to be presenting those uh, at some point in time. Let's go ahead and dive into the charcuterie that you guys got today. Um, Nathan, I hope I'm good on time. So you guys got Pinocchiona, um, Georgia Blue, and Spanish Salchichon. So diving into what we call New American Charcuterie, um, Georgia Blue probably represents that really, really well. Um, if you guys take this out of the package, you can sort of hold it up to the light and you'll start to see little clear globules. It's not fat. What that is is blue cheese. Ooh. Um, we paired, uh, we partnered rather with uh, Sweetgrass Dairy, a beautiful little dairy down in Thomasville, Georgia. Um, and they started making a, a beautiful blue cheese called Asher Blue um, about a year and a half, two years ago really dialed in the recipe. Um, and I know uh, Jeremy and Jessica down there uh, were having some challenges getting the bacteria right. But they finally landed on a beautiful, beautiful ratio for making this cheese. And we decided to part with, partner with them. What has a better nuance of flavor and integrity um, to mix with the protein and the fat inside cheese? So we utilized the blue cheese to make a beautiful little new American charcuterie called Georgia Blue. It's uh, partnered with Sweetgrass Dairy and that's the, uh, the Georgia Blue salami. Um, does really, really well with big fruit spreads, um, alpine, alpine cheeses pair wonderfully well with it. Um, anything a little bit uh, more creamy because that acidity of the blue really holds true and it gives it a wonderful sour. The next salami is an Italian classic, one that's probably been made over 2000 years, a thousand years, I don't know. I mean, it's been around for a really long time. So why, pardon my French, but why F with the classics? Pinocchiona is a, just a, a wonderful balance. And if it's been made for that long, there's probably a good reason. Uh, that's because that fennel seed just speaks beautiful volumes of floral, um, just wonderful fragrance in the salami. Um, our Pinocchiona is made with toasted fennel seed, um, a little bit of anise, little Calabrian chili flake. It's absolutely beautiful. Before you put any of these salamis in your mouth, make sure you hit them on your nose first. Give them a good smell. Um, really what you're trying to achieve is balance. Um, and we try to speak to that in all the meats that we make. Having a salami without balance is, it's like having a boat without water. It just doesn't go. Um, you really wanna have, to be able to try to create a flavor profile that you're gonna get sweet, salty, bitter, a little bit of umami, and make sure that those palate, those, all those things get in your, your mouth and they really swim and they speak to you and they're, they're something that you wanna take another bite. And that's what you're trying to achieve is that perfect bite, that perfect balance. And we try to achieve that not only in flavor, but also in the texture and the integrity. So you've got a good mouth feel. It's not too thin. It's not too thick. Um, you've got a good bite. Um, and like I said, this salami uh, coordinated with others around the country is going to be a little bit more supple, a little bit more soft. Um, really, really nice though. The next salami, and this is um, one that can be enjoyed pretty much year round. All three of these salamis um, can be eaten year round. Delicious and all the right. And we sell these guys uh, whole and in slice format. The next salami got a... Um, we, we kind of irritated some Spaniards when we developed this one because Spanish salchichon, if you buy it in Spain, by and large, should never have piment on. Well, we're doing the new American thing and it's a new American charcuterie that we like to create. Um, not only do we do piment on in it, but we put a little bit of Spanish sherry and then it's got a little bit of uh, organic garlic, uh, Mediterranean sea salt, and then we do something that's absolutely, from a Spaniard's perspective, shouldn't touch, but we cold smoke it on pecan wood. Uh, if we're smoking anything in the Spotted Trotter's uh, kitchen, it's always going to be with pecan. It's got a very perfume, very aromatic flavor profile. It's not like mesquite or hickory that'll just hijack the flavor and run with it. This is something that's going to give them an element of balance and flavor in the, in the, uh, in the process itself. Um, Spanish salchichon, beautiful with Spanish manchegos, any kind of big, big, deep sheep's milk cheese and Argentinian wine, or that, that uh, Alvaroso sherry will pair quite lovely with this one. Um, by and large, all this, the meats that, that we create are all made with humanely sourced and pasture protein. Um, one of the things that sets us apart is that we, uh, we toast and grind all our spices in house. We don't buy bulk spices. We don't have anybody else involved in the recipe creation. Everything we do at the Spotted Trotter is done here. Um, we, uh, like I said, we, we make sure that we toast all the spices and what that does is brings out the natural 
oils of the spice um, and you taste it with the fragrance, the whole kitchen just warms up with the smell of toasted fennel or juniper berry. We get a, a lot of just beautiful creative things that, that quite frankly, you don't see around in the kitchen. Um, once those meats are, uh, or once those sp spices rather are, are toasted, um, everything gets ground and we put, the, put that on the whole meat and we let it sit for a minimum of 24 hours. That gives the meat just a beautiful, beautiful way to pull in those spices and hold that flavor. Um, and then that goes to grind after 24 hours. Um, once <laughs> someone said their box didn't arrive, Nathan, so we'll have to hit them with uh, maybe an extra. Um, and once the meat's been ground, uh, all the meat will ferment for the longest legal limit allowed by the USDA, which is 72 hours. Um, it gives it a, just a beautiful funk. Um, the mold starts to get really inside the integrity of the meat. Going back to what mold does, mold does a number of different things, but my, my, the most important thing for us is that it creates a beautiful sour. Um, it protects the meat. So by and large, you put the bacteria in, um, which basically raises the acidity level and it also reduces the pH. This is, uh, enables it to reach what's known as lethality in the USDA world. Um, once it reaches lethality, it kills all the bad bacteria. It doesn't give the opportunity for bad bacteria to thrive. The last thing, and I think this is the most important thing about what the mold growth does, it helps to protect the salami. So as the mold starts to create this exterior uh, barrier on the outside of the meat, um, what it's going to do then is it enables the meat to dry at a slower rate. If the meat dries too fast, you get known what's as, gets you get what's known as case hardening. So the exterior part of the salami will get a skin. Well, the skin enables the um, uh, doesn't enable the humidity uh, to evaporate from the inside of the meat. And so what happens is the bacteria starts to just basically cannibalize itself and chews up the meat and they have these giant on the inside of the salami. So the bacteria or the mold growth enables it to protect it, dries at a slower rate, doesn't allow the evaporation to happen too quickly. Um, and it gives you a beautiful, beautiful texture, uh, moisture content in the salami. You have a, um, one, one question, Kevin. Uh, yes, from, from the group, Tom is asking, does adding Asher Blue to the salami affect the shelf life? So that's a great question, Tom. Thank you for asking. And um, I will tell you that we haven't had any challenges thus far. Um, you know, putting it in these packs, and these packs are, um, they're what's known as MAP, Modified Atmosphere Packaging. Um, they take uh, they take all the oxygen or as much of the oxygen out as they possibly can. You can't pull 100% out. So, you know, to your point in question uh, about, you know, does it, is it going to affect the shelf life? It shouldn't. The only thing that really should affect the shelf life is the amount of time that it's, that it's uh, without air and the amount of time that it's without moisture. Um, if you add, if it gets any uh, penetrations inside the packaging, obviously letting oxygen in, it's going to change the color. It's going to change the integrity, obviously the flavor. Um, but really you've got about five to six months of shelf stability uh, on these packages and they are shelf stable. Um, you know, obviously if you keep it in a cold environment, it's going to last a little bit longer. Um, but by and large, as a culture, we in this United States are used to buying meat uh, in a cold environment. So most folks like to put it, you know, in the deli case or someplace that it's going to be cool, but it can thrive and do just fine um, in a uh, shelf stable environment. Nathan, I hope that that gave That's, you what you needed. Um, do, what I needed. Am I at my time? I could talk you, till I turn purple, but I don't want to. I make. know. I, I was worried about uh, putting you and I both on uh, on one show, so to speak. <laughs> no, that was beautiful. Thank you very much. Uh, remember, everybody, the Spotted Trotter. Um, you guys have tasted the meats. I thought they were very, very good. Uh, and keep those questions coming. Again, you've got a you've got a pretty educated panel here. Uh, to help answer any and all questions that you have, keep asking questions. All right, coming up next, um, we, we've got Maha Frege. I had to make sure I said her last name right. She is the president of Three Little Pigs. Now, this company I, of course, have known for a while since I started back cheesemongering in the early 2000s in New York City. Uh, and the first time I ever had duck rayettes was from here. I'm going to shut up. Hand it over to you, Maha. Just hit on mute and you're ready to go. Hi, everyone. Uh, thank you for the opportunity to speak in front of uh, all of you. Uh, Les Trois Petits Cochons uh, started in 1975 as a very small charcuterie shop in the village. It was called Les Trois Petits Cochons Charcuterie. 
And at the time, the word charcuterie was not known as well at this, at, as it is known now. So those two chefs came to the States with a big dream to open a restaurant and they did not have enough money. So they decided to open this little uh, hole in the wall in the East Village to, uh, to practice what they love to do. So their passion from day one is to make uh, food uh, as you cook at home, no preservatives, no additives, no coloring. And they were the first product they produced in that shop was pâté de campagne, country pâté, and other uh, French famous dishes that attracted a lot of uh, people who lived in the neighborhood, uh, which were one of them, uh, two of them were uh, James Beer and Mimi, Mimi Sheraton, Miss Claiborne. And they wrote about articles about this little hole in the wall producing awesome, awesome recipes which brought this shop to fame in two years where they had to shut down the shop and start uh, producing at Eco Packer in New Jersey. To find out a few years later that uh, the Eco Packer was selling the same product behind the doors to other uh, retailers at half price. When three little pigs found out what's going on, they right away started looking for their own facility to produce their product, which we are now uh, in Wilkesbury, Pennsylvania. We have 25,000 25, square feet of production. Uh, and from there, it's uh, an old story. Now we've been uh, doing all natural product. Uh, we, we went uh, to the ABF meet right after. And then ABF meet is uh, we're using hormone antibiotic free meats. And now we produce a line of organic pâtés as well. Next, please. Uh, so Three Little Pigs logo has been on for a long time. Recently, we started to, uh, to refresh the brand, as you see here. So now it looks a little different than it did for many, many years. Uh, but what didn't, what never changed for us is the handmade part of the product. We still produce very small batches. Our biggest batch is 300 pounds. So 300 pounds translates uh, to the three pound pâtés, we make 50 cases. And on the retail part, 100 cases. So you can tell if we're doing 10 batches of an item, we do 10 separate batches of the item. And we feel this keeps us uh, making upscale product, little batches and not industrial. So our mission is to create more enjoyable everyday moment, uh, casual charcuterie, where you're in Europe, you know, people eat charcuterie for lunch or the first time I had duck riette in Europe was in the morning on a piece of baguette which was unbelievably delicious. And I was shocked, I'm, I'm gonna eat meat early in the morning. Yeah, it was great. And I wish I can do it now. Next page, please. So we're redefining uh, pâtés and lunch meat charcuterie by bringing it up to another level with, uh, we back it up with years of experience and years of creating these delicious uh, uh, different recipes we make. And uh, we, we started, yes, we're making uh, pâtés and mousses. And then we moved 20 years ago, we moved to making, to produce a French ham. What is a French ham? Next, next slide, please. A French ham that we put on the market over 20 years ago, is made of three muscle ham. You taste it like you, it tastes like you're cooking a piece of meat in your oven. It's not processed, it's made of the three muscle. We inject the brine, less than 10% brine in the meat for the flavor, which the USDA allow us to put uh, cooked ham, to claim the cooked ham on it. So when uh, Alain Cinturel came out with this uh, product, he decided to cook it sous vide. And we were not allowed to say the word sous vide to anybody because nobody knew what sous vide was at that time, which 
what we do is we put the skin of the ham, put the three muscle in it, the three injected muscle, close the bag and cook it under cryovac, which gave us over a year of shelf life. But of course, after a few months, the taste flow, flavor, the flavor of the product is not the same as when it is under six months. So we decided to claim only six months of shelf life on that product. And yes, the word was very secretive. No one can say why, how, how do we came up with that long shelf life of uh, the Jambon de Paris. So as this product is one, it's, it's one of our top sellers, recently we decided uh, to produce it in a sliced format to be able to make it easier for people to make their own charcuterie board at home. And uh, if you go to the next slide, So this product can be made in a salad uh, next to, uh, uh, put, I'm sorry, uh, potato puree uh, in a sandwich. And there are many, many ways of using uh, this delicious ham. As you please, if you please, if you have any questions uh, tasting the ham, please let me know. Uh, I wish, I hope I will answer the question. But it's a clean taste of meat, and you can feel that the product is not processed at all. And the best part, like uh, we use it, we sell it to a ton of French restaurants. They use it on their uh, croque monsieur or croque madame. This product is also available sliced in a one pound format for food service as well. And the most recent thing is now we are launching four more flavors of this delicious product. Uh, we have a rosemary ham, jambon fumé, smoked ham, uh, uh, jambon with rosemary. Uh, sorry, I repeated myself. Uh, with truffle and another one with, uh, we co-branded with Mike's Hot Honey and we, uh, we, we're launching one with uh, Mike's Hot Honey. Pretty soon. Please, next page. So the, the second uh, uh, product I would like to talk about is Duck Riyadh. This is really one of my favorite, favorite products. It's based, it's very simple. It's duck meat cooked its own uh, juices with some spices until the meat shreds away. And I always explain it like uh, to the American people who don't know anything about charcuterie. It's a simple product. As you cook your uh, shredded uh, meat, it's like, like the meat is cooked until it's shredded like uh, uh, what you call it pulled pork, but without any barbecue, of course, uh, barbecue sauce. So it's one of our best, best selling product. It's found in a lot oh, of- uh, Excuse me. It's found in major places such uh, retailers such as Whole Foods, uh, Wegmans, all these big retailers. It's very very popular in the in Q4 for the holidays, and there are so many ways we could uh, serve it. We could serve it on a piece of baguette. We could serve it. Uh, Nathan, if you uh, turn the next page to see the. Uh, uh, we also uh, promote a duck uh, riyat empanadas, uh, which uh, simply you, you add some onions to the riyat and uh, put it in the empanada dough and fry it. Uh, my favorite part is on the charcuterie board, of course, with some cornichon uh, that uh, cleans the mouth from the uh, fat uh, flavor in it. But it's really one of the top, top, uh, for me, uh, item on a charcuterie board. So Nathan, you could add it to your next charcuterie board because it's uh, meat and real. So if you guys have- well, I, I will add it to my charcuterie board every single time. Sorry. Thank you. <laughs> thank you. So if anybody has any questions, I'm here to answer and thank you for listening. So there's, there's a question that popped up from Sergio. Um, are there spices in the duck? Yes, we spice the duck and uh, it's proprietary, so we don't uh, mention uh, what- so A secret blend? Yes. 
You got it. It's a Sergio. Look, he's trying to make it at home. It's a secret blend. You're going to have to go buy it. Uh, yeah. Reach out to Three Little Pigs. Leave. Uh, I think it's put in. If you contact them, uh, they will send you samples. <laughs> so the uh, the duck riyat, uh, the beauty about of the duck riyat is also cooked sous vide. So it has a lot of shelf life. Uh, it's uh, It has 14 weeks from date of production. What about, there's another question from Maria. She's asking, what, do you, what is the shelf life of the pat, of the, the riyat once it's opened? Once when you open it at home? Once it's open, it's good for about five to six days. Like everything else in your fridge. You know, if you eat some of it, if you wrap it tight, it really lasts for a week. But like anything in the fridge, once it's open, it's exposed to air and bacteria, the shelf life starts uh, going away. And it comes in a nice container with a lid on it. So yeah. it's easy once you open it up, if you can just dip it out of there, put the lid back on and pop it back in your fridge and it's good to go. I frequently and, have it in my fridge, I know. <laughs> and it's a small portion. It's only six and a half ounces. And uh, the sad thing is when I open one, I eat the whole thing. That's not good, but <laughs> it's so delicious, like eating ice cream. And Riette was, you know, uh, it's, it's not a new invention because back in the day where they did not have refrigeration, so they were cooking the meat in its own fat to preserve it for the winter time. And, it's, uh, and that's how it was created many, many centuries ago. So we refined it, we cook it, and we cook it in a safe way. Our plant, uh, of course, we follow all the SQF rules and, uh, and the food safety is one of the major, major uh, uh, item that we pay attention to. All right, and we've got another question popping up. I think this was referring to the ham. How do you keep the pink color without nitrates or nitrites added? So now we are using uh, celery juice and uh, on the ham. So some of the ham, we have a line, what we, we have, um, we use celery juice to keep the, the color light pink. If you notice, it's not very, very pink, it's light pink. Mm -hmm. And even in the pâtés, we don't use any nitrites. And once you open it and expose it to air, the color starts to fade away. And uh, as time goes, it gets, it's like grayish. It starts to be grayish. So is the ham. If you keep it open out for a long time, uh, it will, uh, it will uh, you know, change color a little bit, not as bad as the pâté. And celery, uh, sorry, it's celery powder that we yeah. use. Thank you. And that means, everybody, that I mean, these products are, quote, unquote, clean. Yes. So if there's anybody out there looking to add uh, more clean products to their set, if you have customers looking for clean, this is absolutely a great way to go. And like, Or if you just simply enjoy eating some clean meats. All uh, these things from uh, uh, Three Little Pigs, perfect for you. Excellent. Any other questions? And, of course, I know uh, there's a question that says celery juice. So celery powder, of course, is going to be the natural uh, additive as far as instead of adding pure nitrates uh, to, the, uh, to the product, and that's what allows it to be clean. Yeah, so natural uh, nitrate uh, uh, from the celery powder, it gets into the product. And it's basically, if you think of this, so there's another question, it's like, so what is celery powder? And, and I, uh, that's basically just dehydrated, concentrated celery, Yeah. correct? Yes, that's what so all our all our meat panelists are agreeing. Yes. And it's a great question because a lot of people don't know that. And that's where it goes into cured versus uncured. And even if you hear about bacon, you know, it's a uncured bacon, so to speak. That just means instead of nitrates, they've added uh, celery powder, which in and of itself, though, is a form of nitrate. And that's why they're able to use it. Cherry powder is an ingredient in the ham also. Yeah. So it's the same thing. So fruits and vegetables have nitrates in them. That's something that we eat. I think nitrates got a really bad rap a while back uh, because too much was being added. And if you consume too much, it was said that it's bad for your heart. But the thing is, great producers such as these on the panel today, it's not about overloading a product just to get flavor. They're going for the quality of the product. And I think by adding too much, that's where you get the bad rap. Uh, but there is nitrates in the vegetables and fruits. 
Uh, and I'm sure if you, and, and I, I didn't mean to overspeak, but Maha or Delia, when you come up, if you want to add to that, please. Yeah, it's a natural occurrence of nitrates in the product. So. Excellent. Great questions, everybody. See, you keep it coming. And what it does, as far as, a, you know, another question coming down here with it, it helps keep the meat pink. So if you see meat that's really oxidized, if you don't add that to it, it's going to get pink. And also you have a higher chance of botulism. And then we don't want that. So you're going to have to have some form one way or another. Awesome. Well, thank you so much, Maha. Any other questions for her? Thank you. That was awesome. And also your products are awesome. Absolutely thank delicious. Thank you. Next up. Last but not least at all, ladies and gentlemen, let me introduce to you Delia Michael. She's coming to us from Ollie. Delia, take it over. Hey, everybody. Thank you for uh, joining, and um, I'll try and move it along so there's time for questions. Um, the Toscano is what's on there, and it's very similar. It's actually could be what Ollie is um, looking at here in this picture. Um, you notice on here and how Nathan did it on his board, he kept the casing on. Um, when you eat it, please take it off. Uh, it's nothing bad is gonna happen to you. You'll get some extra fiber, I guess, for the day or some collagen if you were into that, but it's kind of gritty and takes away from it. But it does look, you know, pretty cool on the, on the board. Um, so um, Toscano, I'm just gonna talk about that a little bit and then kind of go through what we do and you guys can ask me questions as we go along. Toscano, uh, very similar to Pinocchiano. Uh, we are of a traditional Italian background that you'll find out a lot about. So we use a fennel pollen in here and not a anise oil. So when you eat it, you are not like taking a shot of anise liquor. It's more subtle. Uh, you will see the fennel seeds in there. We do not roast them or heat treat them at all prior to putting them in with our hopes that if you do apply heat to it, either through a sandwich or a pizza or however you choose to later, you are going to experience an even greater aromatic and flavor profile of that product. So if you're eating that uh, room temperature on a charcuterie board, fantastic. You're going to get this beautiful, subtle pollen taste to it. If you heat treat it, it'll be bigger because our assumption is when you heat treat that, you're putting cheese or mustard or something else with it. You need a bigger flavor profile. With that said, this chub, um, is a room temperature item. Uh, we prefer that it's merchandised ambient. Um, you should keep it ambient as much as you can at home. Um, you know, I hail from South Florida, so that doesn't always work in the dead of summer. But if you can, just keep the casing on it as much as you can. Eat um, what you've peeled away and then just keep the casing on there. As uh, mentioned earlier, it acts as a skin and it protects it. But once you open it and if the skin, if the molding and casing stay on it, you have about 10 days shelf life if you wrap it up really nice. So Ollie, as a company, we started about 11 years ago um, outside of Richmond, Virginia in a converted dentist office, which was um, a fascinating adventure all on its own to convert that. We actually started as a prosciutto company, which was not um, probably the brightest uh, idea on our part, you know, because as, as, I'm, as we've talked about products, uh, that process is about 12 to 14 months minimum to find out if you have a great product, right? Um, versus if you age this uh, chub here, um, you're looking at, you know, eight to 12 weeks, depending on the dynamic uh, that you're aging in to know if you have a great product. So um, that's, that's really how we started. Uh, we started and cut our chops and got into the market as a chub company. Um, we've always been an antibiotic free company. Uh, that's how we started. That's kind of how we've made our name. Um, that we have a couple standards around that, that we and our farmers have agreed to, and we hold pretty firmly to today. And that is a never, never product. Meaning that piglet can't be injected when it's born and core out clean at slaughter. Uh, it has to be antibiotic free the entire time, right? Um, and then the second thing that we have and we can certify and that we uh, kind of tie our name to is that we have to have 100% vegetarian fed animals. Um, and then what holds hand with that is a lot about what was talked about at the end of the last section is no nitrates, no nitrates added. We also use a celery juice or powder or some combination thereof, depending on what product we're producing and what kind of mouthfeel we're looking for. Um, you, for example, are eating something that uh, the chub is a 55 millimeter diameter. So that tends to be 
even though it's cured for less time than our larger format pre-slice, um, it's going to be a harder, denser uh, mouthfeel. We then moved to Southern California in 2015. Um, we purchased a piece of property and built our own facility, 80,000 square feet out there. Um, our goal at that time was to be able to produce a consistently really great tasting product at about 150,000 pounds a week. Um, and so our hope was to grow our line, right? To grow away, to keep chubs, right? But also to go into precise, eventually snacking in the bulk or behind the glass. So we were really looking to um, do something really well. I will tell you also when we moved out there in 2015, we got rid of a lot of things that I know people love that we made, like our lardo and our pancetta, but we really wanted to focus on making one thing really well and really consistently. Um, and we also made a lot of investment in packaging. So we don't use a co-packer. We're a pretty vertically integrated company. Uh, we get in whole muscle and we put your product on that LTL truck, or if you can pick up from us, we put it right on it. So everything in that process is under uh, was under one roof, now under two roof, but is, is controlled by us. Um, we also heavily invested in technology, uh, which kind of really helped during the pandemic that we try and reduce the stress on the folks who work for us by having a lot of technology and some of that. Um, so we're trying to marry this old world handcrafted at the beginning of our process um, and then slowly making it more technical as the process goes on and we'll kind of see that. Go ahead, Nathan. Um, these are just kind of basic things that we are we are known for: uh, high protein, antibiotic free. We have started dabbling in conventional product, really through mostly private label items um, that people are asking for. But no fillers ever. So um, you know that that means no soy, no milk powder, no crazy things like salt, dust, or pink slime is going in there. And then no artificial nitrates or nitrates. I think we've talked about that plenty. Slow cured so that um, our rooms are at 70 degrees. Um, cooking is about 170, so we stay away from that. So if you're working with us to develop a product and I tell you, you know, we can get it for you, but you know, you have to work with me on eight, 10 week, sometimes 16 week uh, window times of just curing process. Uh, that's because we will never rush that process. Uh, we fully believe in the slow cure. We fully believe that's where the flavor profile comes from and we wouldn't be able to, uh, you know, really stand behind our product if, if that wasn't the case. Um, so, you know, on the go and keto friendly, you know, that's just the trending thing and we, you know, adapt accordingly as a business, right? Uh, go ahead, Nathan. Um, so what you can see kind of on the right-hand side here is our slicing machine. We call this, uh, this is a pre-sliced machine. We call this the Ninja Slicer. So that product basically from when it is peeled and put into the slicer to when it is packaged um, in, in that packaging, it's about 45 seconds. It's a pretty awesome thing to watch if you're in the plant. Um, and it moves along these belts that are, you know, the cleaning process alone in between um, items and shifts is insane. But, this is, this is a good example. And then on the right, this is really what we were hoping to achieve when we built from the bottom up. These are custom aging rooms. You can see like a curve in the floor for airflow. You can see that it's a four rack high stack. Because for us, because we need the time, we were unwilling to compromise on time. We had to create a lot of vertical space so that we could have good airflow, great hanging product, but not compromise and, and turn into a, a cooking process, right? Um, so this is just a little more about you know, the statistical part of that. Go ahead, Nathan, if you want. Um, so uh, actually, over the pandemic, things kind of, for us, we looked internally and looked at investment and, and what we could do. So uh, we had a lot of our lines in what we called our flex space. And so what we decided to do is like kind of right down the street, you can see the map there, we acquired 40,000 more square feet, and that's where we do our cold storage that houses like a lot of offices now. And we've really expanded our fermentation and aging rooms. Um, so we started with three, and now we're up to 12 on the aging, and we're up, we started with one fermentation, we're up to four of those. 
Um, and we are now, instead of doing 150,000 pounds a week, we can do up to 600,000. We haven't gotten there, but I don't know how far off that is. We started with two lines and now we have 12. So basically under one roof, we have all the, all the raw production, all the fermentation and curing, and then all your packaging is under there. So if you, you and I are working as, as uh, client and customer or whatever, and you, you say to me, hey, I have a leaker, and I, and I ask you, hey, uh, can you just send me a picture of the lot number? You're one person away from talking to our QA team, and we can have a solution. We can look at what that production was like on that line. All that is turned around very quickly because that all sits, sits in house. Um, and then just to kind of give you an idea, I mean, these are taking, these pictures are taken on production day. We are very proud of our plant and our QA does an amazing job. This is how clean it is every day. Um, you could come to our plant and this is what you'll see. Um, these are like live production photos. Um, and that's pretty close to what it, what it looks like every day on the, Bottom left there, you can see an automatic boxer. We did that after we had some, we have a lot of, you know, repetitive work, right, in the plants. So we try to, to help our folks out as much as we can. So that was kind of one of our investments to, to help folks um, not have to do as, as much heavy work. Basically. And then on the right is just kind of a side view of a pre-slice uh, machine. And then just slice so go ahead, Nick. Uh, we're SQF2 certified. I, that means something to some folks, but um, for us, that just lets you know that, that we, again, take cleanliness, our HACCP plan, our five log reduction process, all that stuff very seriously. Um, and we are basically that your product is 100% traceable under our roof. So that SQF2 certification goes from um, whole muscle raw all the way through uh, the cold storage process. Go ahead. Um, you can skip this one. And then I'm just going to go through a bunch of different packaging that we do. So these are our grab and go snacks. These we work with a lot of other great folks that I'm sure you guys work with. Like I can, you can tell the little fans and all the crackers are in there. We work with every, different cheese producers, Belgioso, Finlandia. Um, and we really try and, you know, we aren't totally American in that way, in that we kind of uh, lean towards the European, like with our Genoa, we didn't put a cheddar, but we put a Fontine, right? So we're trying to kind of, you know, bring great product forward and also kind of stretch the imagination a little bit. Okay. Um, this is our new guy. This is our classic American. We finally broke down and did it. Uh, this is pepperoni mozzarella and cracker. You can just keep going. You can go kind of quickly through these. I'll just talk about them. Entertainment trays, antipause trays. We do all food matches, our main partner here um, with all the fun stuff you see there. This is our new one as well. Pre-slice, very traditional flavor profiles, um, except for probably the hard is the most American thing to do, um, smoked um, process. These are little snackers. This is, this is something I should let everybody know here. If we're producing something with cheese in it, we produce with 180 days. Um, and if it doesn't have cheese, it has 300 days shelf life. And if it does not have cheese, um, we think it, it tastes better and it performs great outside of the refrigeration traditional merchandise space. So uh, with like this one here, you see we put a little uh, shipper in there that has some talking points. So, you know, it can sit on your POS or whatever. And, um, you know, it doesn't have to be long sold. Um, and this is just a great example here of how we look at our labeling. We look at this as something that we're trying to communicate to the customer because we know special departments are crazy busy. We know not all of your team members have a thousand hours of training or whatever in charcuterie. So we try and make it pretty clear and pretty easy to go. Slow cured, honored methods. In other words, that is reflecting that we are a fourth generation salami producing company um, and that knowledge that comes with that. Uh, what the protein call out is for all our lovely friends at the uh, dietary trends. Um, so this is our bread and butter. This is probably the full line of what we you can get from us. There's some new flavor profiles coming out, but this has everything that we make in here um, from, you know, Genoa to Tartufa. Go ahead. And this is an example of our full product for behind the glass. And that'll be the end of it. Oh, no, I'm sorry. Up and coming R&D stuff. So these are Salamini. These are like uh, we used to do these. These are reworked to be more of a, a European style hunter's sausage. 
Um, and this is where some of the new flavors. So this is us experimenting with bourbon and a different type of spice in the piquin. So um, go ahead, Nathan, the next one. And then we're also doing a couple different format packaging. Uh, you can see a trio up there on the left for entertaining and uh, a two compartment um, snacking item. Uh, I imagine both of those will probably be some round cube. All right, and that's two. Okay, so that's us in a nutshell. Um, and I'll take any questions if anybody has them. Yeah. Uh, oh my God. Thank you very much, Delia. Uh, yep. This that was amazing. So we're not done just a second. Don't rush out, everybody. Uh, but what questions do you have? Um, we've learned today. We talked about uh, dry curing. We talked about fermentation. We talked about cooking, uh, and I mentioned a little bit about the smoking of meats. So hopefully you've got a good little base to build off of. Besides that, I hope you noticed that. Everybody, all the companies that were on the panel today make good meat, quality products. They actually take the they take pride in what they're they're doing. They use great ingredients and great quality meat. So whether you're looking for something personal or to pick up to carry in your store, hopefully this helps you out. If you already carry it, now I hope you have a better grasp on what to say to customers, how to talk to your customers to put it into baskets, because that's what we want. Of course, GFI wants to sell to, to you guys, and you guys, of course, want to sell to customers. We got to get it in that basket. So help us carry it from here to there. But everything here is absolute quality. So I'm going to run my mouth for another second to allow you guys to ask any questions. Or how about this? What was your favorite tasting of the day? Did you get to try any of this? Um, I did hear uh, about the blue salami with the um, shell and bell and the sour cherry. I heard that was mentioned earlier as far as one of their favorite tastings. Did everybody get to try some? The duck rayette with sour cherry spread. Shut the front door. I don't know why I didn't think of putting that. <laughs> I'm always, with duck rayette, I always think something just tart, right? But sour cherry spread, I'm going to try that out. Thank you, Kimberly. Anybody else have a favorite tasting from today? I kind of, I mean, I did expect, but like, I also like the ham. You know, I think we forget sometimes that, you know, ham may get like a plain wrap, but that ham was amazing, right? Some of the snack pack units have several issues. Uh, all right, Tom, talk to Delia and she'll be able to help you out with that. She'll be able to give you all the answers to that. Uh, and I'm pretty sure she'll reach out to you. Uh, but some of the packing, and again, they say they do it in-house. So besides bringing you quality products, they are trying to bring you uh, a good, uh, good packing, basically. And sometimes things happen, but I'm pretty sure we'll get that settled out. But no, the owner is... To, do you want ahead. me to answer that or no? Yeah, 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 if you want to. So usually it's a seal break. So one of two things will happen. Maybe somebody used a knife when it opened it up. You know, if you look at it closely, sometimes salami shifts under the seal or the cheese, and it'll just get a little, enough air in there, because we don't use preservatives. Um, that's a great way to test all of us. Um, it gets a little oxygen in there, and it's going to turn. Whoever you're buying that from, just let them know, and we're always happy to credit that. Um, but we also, like I said earlier, love the lot number, because it's just something for us, because, you know, there's an industry standard, right, of course, for how many things can go wrong, but we always try and be better than that. So if you could, if when you submit those credits back to whoever you're buying it from, or you can submit them directly to me, that's fine. Um, I think Nathan probably has all our contact information yeah. for you guys. Um, that's just send us a lot number and we'll, we'll issue credit. That's not a problem at all. Yeah. Thank y'all for bringing it up. Like we want perfection, but we don't live in a perfect world. Things are going to happen, whether it's uh, you know, and it's it's not about a, a blame thing either. Like we as a distributor and our sales team, we need to know because we work with vendors who care this much and we can have direct relationship with to solve the problem. So everybody on our end, we want to make sure we're getting something perfect. Uh, awesome. So Georgia blue salami, shell and bell and sour cherry combo. Talk to me. I love it. Finocchiona, love the spotted trotter. Uh, Donald says Finocchiona makes me want to uh, curse my local grocery store for not buying better. Uh, mention to your local grocery store to buy better. You know, if customers talk to uh, the, the, the managers, they can make a change. I love it. Uh, Spotted Trotter, solid products, tastes amazing. That's great. 
Uh, the whole time we were tasting, I was uh, what craving uh, botanist and barrel cider. Oh, I like that. Katie, cider would be awesome. Other than that, team, thank you all for uh, being with us, for joining us. I hope you learned and I hope you had a good time and tasted some great products. If you like what you see today, pop on to the YouTube, to our Institute du Fromage uh, channel. This is where I post all of these trainings. I have other trainings posted. They're free to watch, free to share. Uh, food knowledge should be available to everybody. So jump on that if you like this to learn more. Uh, if you run a specialty department and you want this guy live, call me up. I'm here to help you out. Naldridge at GFI.com. My name is Nathan Aldridge. Always happy to educate and motivate your sales team. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, we're going to have another IDF coming up in May. So stay tuned uh, for future. We're going to be going shifting back to a little bit of cheese then. And thank you so much to Delia, to Maha, and to Kevin. Thank you all very much for participating. And thank you for helping us send all of these beautiful samples to all of these amazing attendees. Thank you all very much. I hope you have a beautiful day and eat good meat, right? All right. Thank you, guys. Have a great one. Thank you.